All right. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Valorian Reading Club. Uh, we've been away for a few weeks, I think. Um, I think I was just too tired the last two weeks to, to run anything. But luckily, at this week's meeting, we're like, hey, what should we do? And we decided that it would be cool to have Abby come in. And in this case, uh, we're going to be talking about um, Tracy and profiling. And so Abby's been working a lot on the code base through optimizations and agent systems and ECS and just a lot of stuff here and there. And so uh, we were also discussing some other potential uh, topics we could go over as well. So maybe in the future, uh, we will have Avi on uh, for other topics as well. So uh, without further ado, Avi, I will bring you on to the stream. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we'll be going over today? Uh, yep. Um, so we'll be covering how to use the Tracy profiler uh, in the context of Valoran. Um, so I guess the motivation um, when you're working with optimizations, uh, it like helps to it helps to measure like what the code is doing, how fast it's going uh, for networking, how many bytes it's using uh, like per message or per unit time or something, uh, because that gets a better idea of how the code is actually performing than like guessing or estimating based on just reading the code without uh, checking it dynamically. And just to add a little bit of context there, um, with Valoran, like one of our big goals is to try and have as many players on our multiplayer server at once as we can, um, mm -hmm. except currently our, our maximum that we want to hit, which is like a thousand players, um, is not viable because of stuff like how much it, how much network it takes to send uh, to people or how much uh, compute resources and stuff like this. And so uh, this is like a, a, another big reason that we care so much about profiling um, after we've already built a decent amount of the game is yeah, trying to optimize a lot of this. Yeah, um, with, with regards to the max player count, we also get measurements through uh, the Grafana, um, which is running on the live server. Uh, and I think for like last release party, we had like uh, 190 players or something at the peak, and it was like stable performance. Uh, just yeah, uh, 195. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, um, this is the uh, the repository for Tracy. Um. Uh, and the. Uh, and the like the version that I'm using. I think the latest master is like not compatible with the uh, with the version of the like Tracy server that uh, Valorian is using, but there's like some possibility that that'll be updated soon, I think. Uh, XMAC would probably know more. Um, so I guess I'll run the uh, server with uh, And so, yeah, specifically, just a little bit about how the workflow of Tracy works is like when we run our server that people can connect to for Valorn, we can also set it up in this case, like as Avi is showing off with like the, this feature flag, which then will allow us to um, use uh, Tracy to ask the server. About yeah, is information. the good or? Um, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. So this is running the server with, uh, with the Tracy feature flag. Um, and I'll also set up the running the client uh, without the feature flag. So uh, to start with, we'll be uh, profiling the server and not the client. Uh, this might take a bit to compile. Yeah, very classic. So I think um, when it comes to client versus server, what are some things that we might care about on the server, but not the client and vice versa? Um, so if you're measuring, um, I guess if you're measuring stuff that you want to measure for like multiple players, uh, so I guess probably like just like overall performance, uh, probably makes most sense to profile the server. Uh, and if you're measuring like individual things, uh, the client, um, they're, so I guess I'm, I'm planning in this talk on profiling the um, profiling the server for physics and profiling the client for uh, networking um, networking bandwidth. Um, 
but that's... I don't think there's, like... Hmm... Necessarily anything that, like, has to be done one way or the other. Like, it, it depends on what you want to measure. Yeah, so I, I think I remember... Um... Some of the areas that I know that we still need to do a lot of work on is stuff like pass, like what we're passing to the GPU. And I don't know how all of this works exactly, but um, making sure that like we're optimizing the the main thread. Um, I guess that's more important on the server, um, and then just optimizing systems as well. All right, so what are we seeing here? Okay, so here we're seeing Voxygen on the left and the um, and Tracy attached to the server uh, on the right. Um, so you can see basically all the threads and what each one of them is doing um, in terms of spans. So currently the, the, the client on the left is not logged in, so um, there's not really much happening yet. These are just the systems running and not doing much because there's no work to do. Um, so if we so if we resume to see like what's what's going on in the current frame and then do this, suddenly you saw a bunch of like chunk generators uh, go past. Let's see. And then just for like a bit more context of what we're seeing here. So each row that has a number on the left-hand side. So we can see like uh, 30, 30,204, 30,247, so on and so forth. Um, these are all different threads, but they're also different processes, right? Uh, sorry, say again? The, so the things each on row. the, on the yeah. left, these numbers, these are all threads, uh, I think running in the context of the same process. Mm, the okay. the x axis is like uh, time, um, so I guess this is probably the cluster of chunks that got generated as I logged in, uh, and you can see it being split across multiple threads in the thread pool. Uh, I think there's a limit on what fraction of the thread pool it can take up to avoid. Uh, uh, to avoid like chunk generation starving like the AI or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there might be a couple of other things that get scheduled to the slow jobs thread pool. Um, so yeah, you can see like on the vertical axis, uh, the chunk generation happening in parallel. Um, and we can see that there's like um, a lot of duplicate chunk generations on each line. And so each, each, like if you were to zoom in, would it represent one chunk being generated? Um, like, so chunk generator right so, here. So yeah. Yes. E each instance of this is a chunk is a, uh, 32 by 32 by arbitrary height, uh, chunk in the world. Mm -hmm. So the, um, So the size that shows up in the mini map here is uh, yeah, like e each one of these pixels without the detailed map is the um, it is a chunk. And then also, like, what's the time scale that we're looking at? Because we've zoomed in pretty far. So it lo okay, so it, it looks like like forty milliseconds. So, so thirty three milliseconds are, is like the oh, it's a frame, yeah, yeah, frame time. Um, let's see how many, uh, yeah, so that's a target tick time of, uh, 30 FPS or yeah, 30 like ticks per second. Uh, if we're hitting consistently 33 milliseconds, uh, it looks like this one, uh, took twice that. So. 
I guess if that, right? so if that sort of thing happens consistently, that means we can only hit uh, 15 FPS. Um, like well, but are these ticks cycle? directly correlated to the frames? Because um, so these, this is 33 milliseconds per tick. These are server-side are... logic. Um, yeah. Or so yeah. yeah, probably. So if we attach to the client, we'd see the rendering in terms of like that, that usual notion of frame time. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, the server side like tick logic doesn't have to coincide like is decoupled from the like rendering logic. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So that's chunk generation. Um, I guess let's like fly around a bit to get some uh, like physics chunks in this uh, thing. Maybe pick up some stones. And so essentially what we're able to do is once Tracy has started looking at um, like profiling either the, the server or the client, then we can start searching by um, specific systems that we are uh, uh, that we're watching over. And so like you, you can't just type anything into here, can you? Or like it has to be specifically stuff that we've exported for Tracy to be able to see. Yeah, this has to be uh, spans that we've uh, yeah exported. So here physics. Um... So here I like I searched for the the physics system. Um, so the overall like physics system runtime found the which one had taken the longest. Clicked it, clicked zoom to zip, and to find like which one took the longest. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like one of so spans are hierarchical. Um, if a if the function that created the span of uh, the physics system run. Um, Call some other function that creates the span, uh, construct voxel collider spatial grid. Um, like that span is a like it is a child span of the other span. So that corresponds to like this part of the code. And okay. I guess this is just a tick where that happens to take uh, like five milliseconds, um, and where that happens to be most of the time. I'm searching for entity terrain uh, interaction because that's another one that like typically takes a while. Um, so that might, yeah. So this is a more like typical like physics tick where we have the the various steps. Um, so we have the the entity to entity physics, then the like applying the results of that. So this is so this like. Apply a pushback, apply movement. Um, this is when you're colliding with uh, with another entity. The like force that uh, like pushes the characters apart uh, that de overlaps their hitboxes. Um, then there's uh, entity terrain collision. Um, this is usually the yeah. Um, this is the longest. Like this has to happen. Like. Uh, for entity, this part is like entity entity is quadratic in the number of entities. Entity terrain is linear in the number of entities. But I guess we probably have like a low view distance, so there aren't that many entities. Uh, yeah, this is with view yeah. distance one. So if we turn this up to twenty, uh, we'll probably get like larger, uh, yeah, larger sizes for physics. Um, and it should just show up there once it. Okay, yeah. So we're starting to see some larger ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you if you move around, then do you think you'll find, or th that it'll try to do one that's different, or is it not very dependent on whether you're moving? Well, let's see. If I like zoom out so I can see a larger number of ticks at once. 
uh, and then resume with current zoom level so this can see in real time. Uh, I'm probably going to make the screen bigger so I can just see more of it at once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like looking at piano music on uh, hard mode. You can see a bunch of chunk generation uh, when I respawn because that like moves my position back to a place where there were a different number of loaded chunks. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I haven't seen this type of view into a program before where it's like, you can see in real time how threading is happening, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is very cool. So let's see if that found us uh, some things with a large number of entity. Entity. Uh... So yeah, oh, so that here we have one that rest. it took like a whole six milliseconds, which is like a lot. Um, that's like a what a fifth of a tick. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so so one you, question, or just one question from it. chat. I'm just going into detail a little bit. Uh, what does the dots and lines represent exactly? So I think like, what, what we're seeing in the in the graphs here, um, just like going into detail a little bit about them. The which the these plots, the, um, the ones at the bottom. I'll I'll assume the ones at the top, just like any little dots that we're seeing, um, like anything here. Like, oh, like these. Um... Those yeah, are, any amount of those, those yeah. Bands like this, but those that are like too short to be to have their names visible. So like this is the AI, uh, which like looks like a dot relative to physics, but like yeah, the the AI is fast. The and then more specifically, so, I guess like we're using the word span, but what do we mean by that? Um. So the. So like span like range of code. Um, so the, these use uh, like RAI, RAII scope guards, uh, like so objects who that um, run uh, clean up when their like destructor or drop implementation gets run to um, to measure like blocks of code. Um, so this like. So this span call here like creates that object with the name construct voxel collider spatial grid uh, that tells the profiler when it's created to like start tracking a span at that like at the corresponding code address call stack uh, call stack sample and then when its destructor gets run like at the uh, like at the end uh, tells the profiler that the span ended. And so just like in, in laid terms, basically what we're doing is just measuring how long this function takes. Yeah, measuring how uh, blocks of code in general, not necessarily functions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so zooming in on the smaller things was actually a good point to, um, a good time to bring up entity terrain. Uh, so it's, it's linear and it's also embarrassingly parallel. Um, so it scales really well with the like number of cores because you can collide each entity against terrain independently. Uh, so here you can see on this particular tick that um, the overall uh, applying terrain collision took this long. Some of it happened on some of it, whoops. Uh, I have to find where I was or a similar situation again. Um, mm. Yeah, if you click on the top, that brings you to a particular frame. Okay, here's one with multiple. Uh, entity to entity is also parallel, even though it's quadratic. It um, it like loops over all pairs of entities, not just over all entities. It still can be done in parallel because we defer applying the um, the updates, the the position and velocity updates that are the result of the calculation, until after we've considered all pairs of entity interactions. That's why this like apply movement is after uh, the apply pushback. Um, so this is actually something that. Um, a design that BorrowCheck helped a lot with coming up with because in order to loop over pairs of entities, you can't loop over the entities 
uh, again when the first thing is borrowed is mutable, um, or when the first instance of uh, entities is borrowed at mutable. So in order to modify the positions, um, you you have to like defer the position updates to afterwards. And then once you do that, it's like straightforward to just change an iterator to a parallel iterator and like loop over the entities in parallel, which gets you this nice like splitting across threads. Um, and I think the like corresponding, like the equivalent of trying to do this in C++ would result in um, position updates sometimes being discarded uh, in cases where there's lots of entities um, depending on like iteration order. Um, so, yeah, so this is an example of the, yeah, the entity is parallelizing well, the terrain parallelizing well. Well, one um, thing I'm sort of curious about as I'm looking at this is in a tick, we see that there's time in which physics is happening and it's like entity to train and then, um, like entity to entity, but in between the amount of time that it takes for the entity entities to do stuff and then the entity terrain to do stuff. Like there's a lot of gap in between there. So wouldn't that suggest that, well, actually, well, I mean, there, I guess there's not enough work to do, but if let, let's say we were playing on the launch server, the, the release server, and there's 195 people on and it was slowing down, like tick, tick speeds were going up to 40 milliseconds. What might some of this look like? Um. Well, in areas where there's like lots of players, like, Again, like this part scales quadratically. Uh, this part is linear over, uh, this part is linear. So in a case where there's like lots of players or entities in the tick, this part would be relatively long. Okay, yeah. Uh, does, uh, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, sort of. And so I, I think, well, I think the, the, I was just thinking about the question. The bigger question comes down to like, um, maybe how do we look at optimizations on the main thread or how do we try? So we, we have two embarrassingly parallel problems here or someone seemingly uh, parallel mm -hmm. problems where we have the entity terrain and entity entity collisions, so, but then how can they be spawned at the same time or like, or started at the same time or did, did they have to do it in a sequence? Uh, entity, entity, and then entity terrain. Yeah. The, uh, that has to happen in sequence. Um, so basically, suppose you have uh, two overlapping, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, uh, like dinosaurs on an airship. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and they're like mostly overlapping. So entity entity has to push them apart. Uh, but they also both have to stay uh, on, they have to stay on top of the airship. Uh, they can't like go through the airship just because they're being pushed apart by, the, by virtue of overlapping. Okay. I so, see. I see. so there, this ordering is required for correctness. Um, but regarding the main thread, like uh, main threads up here, all of this is happening like in like rayon thread pools. Um, this shouldn't uh, like this only blocks the main thread because there's an explicit like join on all the systems finishing. Uh, this isn't happening like on the main thread proper. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think which, yeah, which like helps with like enforcing timeouts. Um, speaking of airships, um, you'll notice if you zoom in that the, uh, apply terrain collision happens twice in sequence. Um, and the first one shorter than the second one. The this has to do with uh, airship handling. The the first one is um, airships colliding, or yeah, airships colliding with the no. This is entities co uh, colliding with nearby airships. Uh, and then the and then the second one when that happens is. Um, uh, all entities, including airships, uh, colliding with the static terrain. Mm. Um, so this has to happen separately because uh, this part has to happen for all entity airship pairs. Uh, and this has to happen for all entities. 
Okay. And then just one question from chat. I, we might have mentioned a little bit, but uh, this tool could be useful for uh, server side to do stress testing. Yes. So this is like sort of mm -hmm. what we're doing right now is we're taking a look at our um, multiplayer server and seeing, okay, well, in each tick, what is taking up a certain amount of time and how does it break down and how do they, like, how do systems interact with one another? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I guess, is there, I'm not sure if there's like an additional part of that question. That I don't know. It was mostly just like a clarification on how uh, some of the stuff's going on. Okay. Um, so, I guess is this a good point to switch to profiling the client and adding the uh, like bite-wise measurements? Yeah, I think that sounds good to me. Okay. Um, so that's running. So now let's run the server without uh, profiling and the client uh, with profiling. So I guess we'll start with uh, without any extra instrumentation, because um, like there are some plots that deal with the that deal with bitewise graphs like already on master, um, but I can show the process of uh, like adding more profiling information. And so, what do you mean by a bitewise graph? So the um, so. The spam-based uh, profiling um, is like one thing that uh, Tracy supports, but it also lets you like plot arbitrary like floats on a like on a graph. Uh, so here here in the server, you see like CPU usage and entity count. Um, so if we're trying to debug like network performance, um, we can plot. Uh, Oh, did we lose you there? All right, we might have lost Abby for a second there. Um, yeah, so I think Abby and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, where when it comes to like a lot of networking stuff, um, being able to plot how bytes are going back and forth between the server is pretty useful. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my um, some of the stuff I've wanted to optimize. And so with Tracy, um, it's definitely really good at seeing what types of things are slow over a certain period of time. Um, and if I just share my, let me just bring up a Chrome tab here. Let me bring up our Grafana. So you can see. Um, Chrome, 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 Grafana, cool. Yes. All right. So with our Grafana, uh, zoomed in a bit too much, maybe. Um, we track like a lot of different stuff on our, our game server. And so um, right now we can like see how many players are online. And this is also public, like anybody can go to it. And so we watch how many players are on the server, um, how fast server ticks are. And so as we've been talking about, we're trying to keep our server ticks below 33 milliseconds. And so um, like currently the, the ticks are like 17 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds and so on and so forth. Um, but then what's most important to me is when we have our release parties, we want to make sure that our servers can handle, um, having so many people on at once, right? Like if we want to like keep trying to get more, more and more people to come up to each release party, then we want to make sure that we can keep handling capacity. Um, and I don't think we'll, uh, it probably doesn't store the stuff from so long ago. Um, but we can see definitely when we're running our release parties that the server ticks are taking super long time. And so what. I'm trying to set up, well, not really. I, I'm not actively trying to set it up. I tried it a long time ago, but I have like a server here at home. It has like um, two CPUs with 24 threads each. And so I wanted to run a Valoran server on one and then um, like a hundred bot clients on the other or like 200, 300 bot clients and then start doing analysis on um, what types of things are uh, slow, what's not working and stuff like this. And so um, for myself, I want to, um, yeah, explore this a lot more with Tracy. And so uh, I, I just learned about like the bit, the bitwise Tracy stuff. So I'll pass it back over to uh, uh, to Avi here. Uh, yeah, um, so it looks like my uh, internet disconnected and I didn't notice for a bit. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I just realized a little bit 
that I like, oh, haven't good. heard a question in a while. Uh, how much did I miss? Uh, um, you were talking. You're gonna explain how the bit why or like like the bit stuff works inside of Tracy or like what what it what what the statistics from it are maybe. Okay. Um. So basically, in addition to the span information, um, Tracy can also plot arbitrary like graphs. Uh, you have to. It doesn't do this uh, like as automatically as the scope stuff, but um, you just tell it to plot a particular float for that frame and it does. So here's like CPU usage. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I've also like attached to a like, yeah, this is the client now instead of the server. Uh, so one thing that uh, you can see here is the um, the greedy meshing is something that's happening fairly regularly. Uh, that's like one of the steps in uh, like rendering 3D models. Um, so that's an example of something that you'd see profiling the client that you wouldn't see profiling the server. Um, oh yeah, this is so cool. Oh, that's so, awesome. You can see like the, uh, yeah, the so CPU. So now you can see all these graphs. Uh, so you can see a big spike up to 1.4 megabytes uh, on first login uh, in, the, um, in terms of how much terrain was received. Um, Wait, is terrain received in bytes or is it in packets? Uh, this is in bytes. Okay. Uh, I think some of the, the ones that are between zero and one are packets. Oh, um, uh, okay. Uh, and this in-game receives versus, or in-game sends versus terrain sends is like a two zero one variables that are which kind of uh, thing was sent, but like just graphing that as a float because you can't easily like graph mm -hmm. that as a pie graph or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you can see also the, uh, the graphs uh, rescale based on which uh, time slice you're looking at. So you can see it goes up to like 1.4 megabytes of terrain on the initial login and then closer to like 150 kilobytes um, filling out the rest of the view distance uh, until the until all of the uh, terrain is loaded and then down to zero because it uh, it finished loading everything in view distance. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that, that's just caring about the terrain stuff. It doesn't care about like any other inputs you're sending to the server or state updates it's sending back. Uh, that's yeah. so cool. So, and you can see if I like walk forward, um, loading another like uh, range of chunks, uh, like in the direction I'm walking, there's like a spike on the terrain receives. So it seems like each, like at view distance 20, each of these is, uh, like 140 kilobytes or so. Um, I think that scales with, let's see, that's a side length. Uh, so that probably scales with either radi radius or radius squared. Let's see, and if I take terrain down to one, then these spikes, yeah, they're like super small. So that's like one chunk, I guess. Or yeah. not, well, it, it might be like uh, three chunks because it's like the, no, it has to be one chunk. One chunk, But that's yeah. still 138 kilobytes. That's, hmm. Is it? Ah, uh, so that's probably, but now they're only a single spike. Whereas here they were a bunch of spikes. So the peak is only like 140 kilobytes, but there's like a bunch of them at once. So the oh, okay. number of bytes sent is actually the sum. So yeah. at, at view distance 20. And here, like, there's only that one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so I think I'll, like, apply the patch to, that gives more measurements instead of uh, uh, recreating it, because um, I think we're a little short on time. All good. Well, so, we still have uh, about, like, half an hour-ish, but yeah, depending okay. on. Let's, you yeah, can walk well, through it like this. In order to, like, extend this even further, I mean. Yes. So oh, this yes, is what... Yeah, this is what a patch looks like that um, adds more plots. Uh, we can um, actually, I'll go through that in. 
Yeah, so we add these uh, create plot invocations to create the, the things that store the data in the client's uh, memory until the uh, until Tracy uh, reads it and like puts it into its graph. Um, and here we just like can plot uh, like float valued variables. Um, so here we have uh, bytes and uh, bytes minus terrain. Uh, these are the new things that are being added. Um, So here, um, I like changed the networking APIs a bit to like when deserializing a type, also return the uh, number of bytes it was, um, so that uh, basically we can get the sum of uh, the sum of bytes uh, instead of just the message count, which was in scope previously. Um, <laughs> And also, uh, here we're using CFG blocks because um, so that we only create the variables if uh, and like only sum the bytes if profiling is enabled. So that's like the equivalent of a C, like if def. I probably should have been compiling while reviewing that code, but uh... <laughs> not good. Yeah, while you were gone, I was just chatting a little bit about the uh, Grafana. Grafana a little bit, yeah. Talking about how I want to like try and set up like a, a home bot test of like two hundred bots and seeing what that profile is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that uh, it looks like Impress added the uh, Swarm client. So like uh, I think probably a couple of releases ago, I added the like bot client that like went from like login to like character creation, but just as like a single bot. Uh, and it looks like since then Imbris extended that with like actually getting them to log in and to the game world with creating a character if one doesn't exist, uh, but otherwise using the existing character and then like walking to um, try and cover as much of the map as possible or something like that. Oh, interesting. I should really so reach out to Embers like with that because that'd it be looks like that's very easy. in the repo under the, uh, uh, I think, like client bin or something. Okay. I'll have to check that out because that would be super easy to test with. I think that was like the thing is like last time I got a little bit stuck on trying to set up that process myself. And so if Embers has already done it, then that'd be very cool. Client examples. Client source bin. Yeah, client source bin swarm. Oh, okay, swarm is in there. Whoa, okay. That's cool. Oh, is that the script for it? Okay, awesome. So maybe yeah. I could just take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has some like automated movement stuff. Uh, some mention of a grid, so yeah, I haven't like run this or checked into it too in depth, but uh, like it seems like it's there to stress uh, terrain loading. Um, mm -hmm. maybe yeah, check exactly. That if there's time after the uh, after the these, yeah, Did it build yet? And it's still building. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it'd be really cool if you could see a, a profile of like what the swarm looks like, like against the server. Well, after we yeah, after stuff. here oh so yeah so this is what the like tracy looks like when you're starting it up and you haven't yet connected it shows you like which clients are listening locally so if you compiled both the client and server with uh uh with profiling uh they both show up here and you can pick one here yeah okay let's see so let's zoom out a little um And it looks like the login blocks the main thread there because that there's like that one frame taking eight seconds. So that's potentially a, like a opportunity for optimization. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so here we're seeing uh, total rec fees uh, and non-terrain rec fees uh, taking like 400 something bytes, even when like not doing much. So that's probably like uh, like position and orientation and velocity updates for entities nearby. Let's see, does mm -hmm. that shrink when I lower? Oh, that's already at one view distance. Let's see, so if I increase the view distance up to 30. Um, yeah, you can see uh, when that uh, view distance switch happened, the like uh, terrain receives went all the way up. Mm -hmm. And you can also see um, non-terrain Yeah, so you can see the terrain receives have like an abrupt spike, but also the non-terrain ones start to like increase because probably these are ticks when either a lot of things are moving or ticks when uh, something that has an inventory like a, a traveler or a merchant uh, comes into view uh, and their inventory, oh, yeah. their inventory has to get synchronized. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big one. Yep. Um, <laughs> so let's see if we turn view distance back down um, That that's one thousand. It was smaller before. Oh, maybe that's the minimum surface side view distance, and it's still sending entities or something. Yeah, interesting. Um, oh. Trying to find. Okay, so you can see a bit of uh, the graph going up because of combat. Mm hmm. Um, I'm trying to find some uh, like sprite to pick up to. Um, <laughs> I love how it looks at view distance one. <laughs> That's so cool. Probably also debug. Oh, I didn't make this character an admin. Um, now there's some twigs. So you can see that uh, that spike there is a uh, twig being picked up. Um, so Interesting. Yeah, so it's curious how it's much larger. Two kilobytes for a twig seems like a lot, uh, and that's probably <laughs> because it's resending me my higher inventory because that's changed instead of just sending like a diff because mm -hmm. like even if even if it's sending the full path like uh what, the like common dot something dot um uh, you know twigs um the like the asset specifier mm -hmm. uh that still should only be like a couple hundred or probably less than 100 bytes yeah um whereas like an inventory of like what, 18 items plus maybe another, I don't know, five equipped, it, that makes more sense being like uh, 2.4 kilobytes. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So should I try um, breaking this down further by message type? Um, yeah, I think that's good. And then also Zester just mentioned um, it could also potentially, oops, it, is, um, it could also potentially be terrain change. So I guess like since you picked up the twig, then there might be other twig or other terrain stuff. Um, mm, oh, but then Zester said that would just be 16 changed, bytes. Would blocks being changed to be sent on the terrain stream or, because I thought even the sparse block updates, um, I thought even those got sent on the terrain stream. The sparse block updates that are used for like explosions and sprites, the sprite pickups. 
Um, so if those are sent on the terrain stream, it wouldn't be that because this separates things out by stream. Uh, but that is a good thing to check. Um, Train chunk update. Uh, okay, it would be common. Yeah, as I mentioned, that server is where that uh, would change. Um. Terrain chunk. Yeah, that would be terrain block updates. Uh, Yeah, those are sent on the terrain stream, so that's not included there. Oh, outcome. How does Git grep work? What's, what's that command you're putting in? Um, oh, git grep, oh, git uh, it's like grep, but only searches for files that are indexed by grep, or by git. Oh, uh, it probably wouldn't be needed if I were using rip grep. I, like, I think that's the default in rip grep. Um, mm, that's pretty cool. Uh, but that, like, avoids searching, like, the target, target. directory, which is, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, large. Yes. Um, yeah, outcomes would be on the in-game stream. So Zesper is right. It could it could be that as well as uh, inventory updates. <laughs> um. So maybe it does make sense that like all the things together between the like the block disappearing, the sound effects, uh, or the position that the sound effect should be played at, um, and so on. Maybe that should add up to like two point four kilobytes. Um. Okay, so let's see. So breaking these apart more by types. Um, so let's see on on the in-game stream. Um, actually, yeah. Let, um, suppose we want to separate out inventory updates from outcomes. Uh, in that, um, we can do inventory bytes. Uh, is the font size good? Yep, looks good. Uh, maybe increase by one. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, better. So let's see, inventory bytes and outcome bytes. And here I'm not bothering with the conditional compilation just to like make it faster for this, but this would need to be polished up before like submitting. Um, and let's see, those are on the in-game stream. So we do match the message with um, Outcomes. Uh, yeah. And then what was the other one? Server general inventory update. Oh, there is a maybe inventory update is sparse. Mm 
inventory bytes plus equals len. And then you have to add a catch all like other. And then where the plots get plotted, we add um, outcome like these. And uh, Tracy takes floats, so we have to just cast to floats. Um, and then inventory. And then we have to create these plots. See if that's everything, uh, and then we leave the server running and recompile the client. And that looks like no errors. Uh, so I guess any questions while this is compiling? Um, I haven't seen any chat of recent. I'm trying to think of some stuff of my own. So essentially, uh, just walking through sort of what we've just. Uh, um, like written up. Do you want to just give a brief overview of that? Um, yeah. So uh, basically, we create the uh, additional plots, uh, Tracy plots, outcome receives, and inventory receives. Uh, we um, so these are both part of so uh the networking splits stuff up into several streams so that i think currently they're all multiplexed onto tcp but uh the the quick backends that uh xmac is working on will be able to like take better advantage of this to like actually send more data like independently in parallel um so that like things that happen on the in-game stream shouldn't block uh, receiving terrain in the background. Uh, so things on the in-game stream being like physics updates and uh, like inventory updates, uh, stat updates like health or energy for combat. Um, uh, and outcomes, which is a like kind of uh, general like event handling thing. Uh, so for things like sprite pickups, um, I think I think outcomes also handle the like um, the little like uh, bleed hit splats that come up uh, in combat, um, or like the poof of things despawning. Um, yeah, so we're separating out these two types of messages and counting their bytes towards two separate counters to plot them. Uh, things that are happening on the in-game stream to try and uh, basically distinguish uh, several possibilities that uh, Zester raised as to what, what exactly happens when we pick up a twig at the network level. Okay. Um, so we reconnect, um, let's see, is the Yep, the view distance is still relatively low, so we should be able to distinguish it. So now there's these uh, additional um, additional plots for. Um, so we still have the. You know, they're resizing dynamically. So we mm -hmm. still have the total receives and the non terrain receives, which is. Uh, so it looks like currently everything is non terrain. And it looks like 
none of the messages yet are outcomes or inventories. Um, so let's see if we drop something and pick it back up. Um, then we see on the inventory graph that our inventory changed twice. Yeah, and that's like 900 bytes for just dropping what one item, which seems excessive given that like the name of uh, the the fully used namespace name of stones isn't that long, uh, and it, like I think the quantity should just be a four bytes. So, and then probably consider another four bytes for a generic enum tag. Like this is probably 10 times as expensive as it should be. Um, One thing I've done in the past is explore our network usage with Wireshark, and so look at like look at packets and then do filtering based on them. Um, but that being said, it's more difficult to break down and say like this packet is built up of like the inventory received type of thing. And so mm -hmm. I guess that yeah, would have to be built more into you overall. Yeah, so you'd have to like debug what the packet is when it's sending in here or something. Okay. So here's some flats. And it looks like those are just inventory. Yeah. So the sprite thing actually, so sprites disappearing actually doesn't seem to be generating an outcome message, or at least not that outcome message. But it is generating like a kilobyte of inventory updates each. Um. So fixing that is potentially beyond the scope of, uh, well, depends on how, uh, how inventory stuff is structured. Um, uh, yeah, an inventory update contains the full inventory. So, yeah, fixing that is probably beyond the scope of the next however much time we have left. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. But at least we know, like, that's uh, that's what happens. Uh, that's what it looks like on the graph. Mm -hmm. um, oh, something just triggered an outcome. Thought it was swinging the sword, but... Maybe not. Um, let's see. I guess is there enough time to demonstrate uh, testing the uh, swarm client on the with profile in the server? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think um, I'm definitely quite interested in that. So it could be a cool okay. little thing to do to finish off with, and so. Um, as you've mentioned a little bit already, uh, one of the difficult things is trying to run diagnostics when we're doing a launch party because we don't want to run like with a whole bunch of extra debug stuff. And so most of the time we just have the, the, the telemetry that is exposed um, from to like to Grafana. And so being able to have a hundred bots on a server, um, <laughs> But 100 bots on the server, 200 bots on the server, whatever, would be pretty cool. Um, from Ubuntu. Uh, some GitLab issues are going to come from this meetup. <laughs> We'd love to see it. Um, another uh, sort of question. So I, I think this one's a lot more subjective. So what distribution do you recommend to mount uh, for the collaborator environment? I will do it in a virtual machine. Um, so what do you think, Abby? What would you recommend to someone who wanted to get started? Um, as far as like beginner friendly uh, Linux distros, uh, Debian maybe. Yeah, I would say like Debian or Ubuntu. Um, now that being said, though, like running or doing development inside of a virtual machine, I've often found not to be so fun. 
Um, so I guess you can pass GPU through. pass through is probably relatively involved. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that might be fine if you're like running the server in the VM and then running the client on the host. Like networking is probably less involved to set up than GPU pass through. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to find what's the right invocation to run the swarm bot. Um, is it a specific branch that you're on? Uh, I think this is just master. Uh, yeah. Oh. Ah, uh, it's a bin, not an example. And it looks like, I think for bin required features, we'll, uh, it's, it's the normal client. Um, uh, it does require the extra features, I think. So, it, but if you just do cargo run bin swarm, you should be fine. And then it'll tell you what to do. And then just add the, uh, the features. I just pass them in and it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. It would be really cool to watch a swarm move to Voxygen to get an idea what is going on internally. You mean like, like instead of being like an external thing that sort of ties in? That's just Christoph's question. Or comment yeah, on that's it. why I launched uh, Voxygen to like uh, see if I can find where the swarm is. Uh, uh, but I don't know if I can send it group invites or if it'll respond to those. So... Uh, Should probably uh, figure out how to form, let's say, 64 bots, each with a view distance of 64. I should probably Ooh. start uh, profiling the server. Um, this is why you're setting this up. I, and I just wanted to like, conclude to the, the question about distributions. Um, it's more likely, so we'll learn can be developed on anything, Windows, Macs, Linux. And so, um, your development environment should be fine in whichever operating system you have. We just, more of the devs prefer to happen or prefer to, or happen to prefer uh, using Linux for the most part. Um, and actually we, we we saw in the terminal here that Avi uses Gen 2, so Avi does like the compilation. So it looks like the swarm is connected. Uh, so you can see it in the uh, other players list. And it looks oh, like- Oh, wow, the that's so cool. Is rising. Oh. Where did it go? <laughs> the entities have dropped off. The thing has died. The user swarm zero. The user needs to ensure swarm zero is registered as an admin. Okay. Uh, Wait, wouldn't that mean you have to do every single one as a swarm? So just like make, I guess the admins list just a ton of names. Let's see. Oh right. Um. So Tracy redirects standard out and standard error to here. So, admin dash dash help. <laughs> I think it's like admin add swarm zero admin. Um, I guess for some reason the help uh, stuff is showing up like all in one thing mm. uh, instead of as independent lines, which is like kind of interacting poorly with the scrolling. Uh, I won't say admin add. I think I named the character admin, but it's not an admin. Uh, so I can try that to see if I got the syntax right. Uh, you bug. Okay, so that works. So I have that now. Um, so now I can run the swarm again be if, because I may have gotten the syntax right for that.
Let's see. Yep, entity count starts going up again. But they're not yet showing up in the other players list. Oh, they are now. Oh, there's probably some like friendly like delay there so that they don't all join at once. Um I think it was so they don't ping the auth too much or something like that. The reason it was slow. Well but, uh, I thought I think it assumes no auth. So I'm I'm not sure. Let's see. Well um, we'll see if it dies. Um Let's see. What was the command for teleport? Oh, there we go. It's dead. Rip. Player. <laughs> um, Some. I don't know what's going on there. Um. So Imbra says it does assume no off. Um. Yeah, curious that it's, it's happening. Or I'm just DMing with Imbra. Um, okay. Ah, it's TP to teleport to another player. Okay, so I can slash TP. It's weird that it happens all of a sudden and it's just everything is gone. There must be like some job that happens every 30 seconds or something. Oh, Checks again. They seem to have disconnected again. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm curious why it happened so suddenly and if that's like, that, that would seem to be a problem if things are connecting as admin, presumably, and then only kicked off after a certain amount of time. Let's see, I'm running this again. Um, oh, only only uh, the first one needs admin because it adminifies the other, the others. And so maybe um, just going to do the server config and uh, I guess you adminify a... So, um, ah, here they are. The, <laughs> hmm. I guess they all have to connect first. Yep. So that, so I guess this is what it looks like if 64 players log in in the same spot and then suddenly disconnect. Yeah. Oh, unless they all, oh, they may not have disconnected. They may have teleported because they're all admins. So if I teleport to Swarm 44 again. Are they? It's over, we're swimming, we're in the ocean. Wait, did they, did you adminify one of them? I adminified Swarm 0 and oh, yeah, okay. so now. That's why this should be fun. So um, do you want to update Tracy? Because I, I oh, it, yeah. um, okay, yeah, cool. So yep. Yeah, so now the entity count is large. Um, oh wow, this see, is so cool. Uh, yeah, now we generation got like a lot going on. With the... I'll try and find some that's like not just like in the middle of the ocean. I'm definitely gonna play with this so much right after we hop off the call. I think uh, I I really want to see like what can I push it to. Zero. So do they all swarm teleport to different places around the world? Yeah, I'm teleporting to like the swarm bots. <laughs> Is it on the ground? Are they? They're not <laughs> setting their Z coordinate based on the altitude. <laughs> So they're teleporting into like the ocean, very far below the ocean, very far below some road. Uh, I feel like they should just be like dropped from the sky. Or I, I guess it shouldn't be too hard to say. There's a thing that finds uh, the nearest accessible Z coordinate. Okay. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. They should probably be using that instead of teleporting. Um, well, I guess for the purposes of like ensuring that the chunk generator is stress tested, this doesn't matter, and this might actually like this hides them so that they don't like interact with, it, so that like normal players don't start poking them or something if they're logged in to the live well, server. Yeah. So maybe maybe this is deliberate. Uh, I guess is Embrus. Uh... Embrus is mentioning there's a parameter you can use to make them clump up. Um... We're just uh, DMing right now. So I would relay to you what I hear. Okay. Uh, it looks like entity count is still climbing. So so this spawned, uh, let's see. Um, it should still be, yep. 
I just mentioned it's more efficient for them to not find the nearest freeze out of position. Isn't it a one-time thing, though? Well, this would be only when they teleported. Um, so, um, yeah, entity count is still climbing. Uh, trunk generation is still running. So, um, yeah, so what's happening here is we have a swarm of 64 bots, uh, each with a view distance of 64. So that's uh, so each of them is loading 64 square. Uh, is view distance diameter or radius? Do you remember? I do not. Because they could be each trying to generate 128 square chunks. If oh, so that if it's could be. Yeah, which I mean, uh, just, yeah. I don't know. I guess that's like good enough to stress test. You just kind of put them anywhere and just say like, get really like a lot of chunks from around you, and then. But yeah, I, I think yeah. chunks yeah. aren't super difficult to parallelize. I feel like. Oh yeah, exactly. They, like this is doing. Uh, you can see all of these things that start with C. These are chunks. How many there. threads do you have? Uh, what do you have? I think twelve. Um... Uh, yeah. yeah. Seven percent of mem so far. Uh, uh, Seven point eight. Yeah, so... And then also there might be a parameter for them to move or not move as well, Inverse mentions. Um, let's see. I'd be interested to see what Grafana... Since this is all like LAN, like, or it's like running on the same computer. Um, I'm interested to see what Grafana would show for like network. Well, because like it still effectively is using network, even though it's on loopback. And so, um, yeah, it'd probably be quite a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm yeah. not familiar with struct opt, but uh, do I just pass like dash dash movement? Yeah, so Christoph mentioned, uh, well, wouldn't spawning inside terrain not stress test physics? So maybe it is worth adding the Z placement. Um, dash, dash movement, true. Found argument true, which wasn't. Uh... Do I just pass the flag? Uh... And you can see the entity count go back down to like very small when the when the swarm disconnects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now this is reconnecting. Uh... It's not capturing the keyboard for some reason. It's not interesting. Hmm. Yeah, something funky is going on. So with the uh, so let's say I, I, now I'm inspired to go and play around with some um, some of this profiling. So uh, what type? What, what what would I need to get up and running with? Um, so I would need Tracy, and then just to to run the game with the the Tracy flag. Uh, yeah, you need Tracy, uh, compiled from, uh, that tag, um, uh, yeah, I think you said, yeah, from 0. 0. 0.7.8, uh, is like at least no good. Um, I think newer versions of Tracy use CMake, but this one, it's like, it, it's just a normal make file. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think it's in uh, profiler builds Unix 
Yeah, and then there's just a make okay. file that you can run, and it generates this Tracy release, which uh, you can run, and that brings up uh, this UI. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, the the yeah the cargo files will like yeah just specify the Tracy feature on the client or server that you want to uh, profile, uh, and it'll like build the client library automatically, um, or build the, yeah, the, the Tracy, Tracy, the, the stuff that lets it connect to Tracy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, not bad. Very cool stuff. And then, the, All right, it... yeah, the swarm invocation is, uh, oh yeah, I want to write that down. Yeah. Too. The, Cargo run, the feature list that it tells you to use for swarm, dash dash bin swarm, uh, and then it takes the, it tells you what parameters it takes. It's like the, the number of swarm bots and the view distance. Uh, and you need to, in the server, you need to adminify swarm zero, but if you don't, you get that error message about uh, uh, the user needs to ensure Swarm Zero is registered as admin on the server. So it, it tells you it tells you at each step what you need to do if it's not fully working. Okay. Nice. Pretty cool stuff. I might try to like write this in, or if you want to like write that little piece into like a, a blog post, that'd be really cool because I think other people can then reference it and know how to okay. get up and running themselves. Cool, cool, cool. Anything else you want to cover before you finish off here? Um. Not that I can think of. Yeah, I think All this right. is probably a good place. Perfect. Yeah, so I think that, that was super cool to, to walk through and experiment with a, a lot of different um, ways of like looking at metrics and caring about certain things. And I, I think like the coolest thing that I saw was like the real time view of how threads are working. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I, now I want to try that on some like either thread Rust code and kind of try learning from from that perspective. Yeah, uh, so actually, so Tracy works with um, uh, yeah. Tracy works with Rust. Um, maybe I should mention like which library we're using as a dependency. Um, it, yeah, it looks like we're using the Tracy client or and tracing Tracy crates. Um, and it looks like we have uh, bindings that make them more convenient to use as part of Fuller and Common. Yeah. Um, okay. So you can use that from any Rust uh, program fairly easily. Uh, it also, Tracy was not originally developed to be Rust specific. So I think, I think it'll work with anything that has like CFFI and has uh, like dwarf metadata. So like, Anything that you can debug in GDB, uh, you can probably uh, profile in Tracy. Okay, yeah. I think there's also been work to make profilers. I think like Puffin by Embark is uh, an upcoming Rust profiler. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of room in that space, I think, for, for tooling and stuff. Um, awesome, good stuff. So uh, yeah, that was the end of today's Code Reading Club. Uh, where we looked at profiling. We'll be back in about two-ish weeks or maybe sooner if I decide to do another um, code review stream. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Avi. And we'll see everybody next time.
Thank you.